Next, we move on to the section of CNS infections. In that, first I'll be discussing about meningitis. Remember, meningitis can be caused by a bacteria or a virus, but most commonly it is caused by a bacteria. And when we talk about the etiology of bacterial meningitis, it is according to the age of the child we can say the most common etiology. For example, if the child is zero to two months or more likely it is like a neonatal meningitis, the common group of organism is gram-negative bacteria like Klebsiella and E. coli. Okay? And after the age of two months, that is between two to 24 months, it is Streptococcus pneumoniae more than H. influenza. Okay? And after 24 months, Again, it is Streptococcus pneumoniae more than Neisseria meningitidis. So, after two months, or we can remember like this, after the neonatal period also, the overall commonest organism is always, always Streptococcus pneumoniae. So this can be an MCQ question also, which is the overall most common bacterial cause of pneumonia in children. Your answer will be Streptococcus pneumoniae. There are some special situations also where organisms may be slightly different. For example, if you have a child with a defect in the complement system, especially C5 to C8 defect, then the common organism is meningococci or Neisseria meningitidis. The next situation, T lymphocyte defect. The common organism is Listeria monocytogenes. This T lymphocyte defect can occur as a part of Dijot syndrome or as a part of severe combined immunodeficiency or as a part of acquired immunodeficiency like HIV. There, Listeria monocytogenes is a common cause. Finally, if the child is having splenic dysfunction, for example, due to a chronic hemolytic anemia, like a chronic sickle cell anemia, or conditions like asplenia, where there is absence of spleen by birth, then they are at high risk of developing infection by encapsulated bacteria. These encapsulated bacteria include Streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitidis or meningococci, as well as Haemophilus influenza type B. Out of this, which is the commonest? It is Streptococcus pneumoniae again. Okay. One more condition is CSF leaks, like for example, uh, CSF otoria or rhinorrhea. In that situation, again, Streptococcus pneumoniae is a commonest organism. So these are special situations wherein the organisms can be slightly different and you should make a note of this. Now we will move on to the features of meningitis in children. Obviously, because of an infection, the child will have fever. Okay. Child can also have seizures. Usually, it is a generalized seizure like GTCS. The other features include irritability, headache in older children, as well as photophobia. In addition to these features, they can also have signs of raised intracranial tension. The important, important sign of raised intracranial tension which you have to look for in a young child is bulging of anterior fontanelle. The classical teaching is that if you have a young child of less than one year of age who is highly irritable with high grade fever as well as bulging of anterior fontanelle, you have to suspect the diagnosis as meningitis. Okay. Now, last you can have some signs of meningeal irritation as well. 
These are the classical signs of meningeal irritation. One, the child can keep the neck very, very stiff, which is what we call it as neck stiffness or also called as neck rigidity. Okay. Look at the second picture, which depicts the Brudzinski sign. What is Brudzinski sign? You passively flex the neck of the child. Reflexly, what will happen? The leg will flex. Can you notice that this hip is flexing as well as the knee is flexing? This is what we call it as the Brudzinski sign. Okay, second sign of meningeal irritation. The next sign is called as a Koenig sign. What you do? You first flex the hip and you flex the knee. After that, what you should do is you should extend the knee passively while keeping the hip in the flexed position. At this point, you will notice that the child is exerting resistance to that movement because this movement elicits more pain in a child with meningitis. This is called as the Koenig sign. So neck stiffness or rigidity, Brudzinski sign and Koenig sign are three classical signs of meningeal irritation. Now, here is an important point which I want to highlight that signs of meningeal irritation are uncommon in a child less than two years of age. A very, very important point. That is why I was telling the point previously that in a young child, you may not expect the signs of meningeal irritation. Instead, you may get fever, irritability and bulging fontanel as a feature of meningitis. So this point should always, always be remembered. What are the investigations you can do in a child with suspected battle meningitis? Of course, the gold standard investigation is CSF analysis by lumbar puncture. Don't forget, in all situations, this is the procedure. However, if you have a child with a ventriculoperitoneal shunt and you suspect shunt-associated meningitis, then what is the investigation you are going to do to take the CSF? It is shunt tapping. I have already discussed this point in the module of hydrocephalus in children. Okay, right. Before we discuss the findings in CSF analysis, let us remember one very important point that LP or lumbar puncture is contraindicated whenever child has features of raised ICT because if you do lumbar puncture in this situation of raised ICT, it can lead to herniation and possibly death also. So that is why in this situation, lumbar puncture is contraindicated. So you can get a question. If you don't perform lumbar puncture, then what is the next investigation you are going to do in a child with raised ICT? And the answer is contrast CT is the investigation of choice here, which will clearly show the finding of meningeal enhancement. That is a finding which will tell you that this child is having an evidence of meningitis. Okay, right. But otherwise, Outside the condition of raised ICT, always, always the investigation of choice is CSF analysis. What are the findings you will get? Of course, the pressure would be increased. The normal CSF pressure is less than 28 centimeters of water. Here it will be more than that. If you look at the CSF, it appears to be turbid because of the presence of pus in bacterial meningitis. Okay. Next, if you look under the microscopy, what will happen to the number of cells? It will be increased in case of meningitis. Okay. Usually there is less than five cells per cubic millimeter. Here it will be increased up to thousand cells per cubic millimeter. Okay. And what is the predominant type of cell you will get? It is usually neutrophils because it is a bacterial infection. Next, what will happen to the level of protein? It would be definitely increased proteins in the CSF. Normally, the levels of protein in the CSF is 20 to 45 milligram per deciliter. Here, it will be more than that 
it is usually up to 500 milligram per deciliter. You can simply remember there is increased levels of protein in the CSF. What would happen to the levels of sugar in the CSF? It would be decreased sugars in the CSF. Typically less than 40 milligrams per deciliter. This low levels of sugar in the CSF is what we call it as hypoglycorrhea. Very important term to be remembered. Low sugar in CSF in meningitis is called hypoglycorrhea. Finally, you can do the culture to isolate the bacteria from the CSF. And also you can do PCR testing to detect the bacterial antigen. This testing is considered as a sensitive test and is highly recommended in the evaluation of meningitis by CSF analysis. So these are the important findings in the CSF which you get in case of bacterial meningitis. Now coming to the complication which can occur. The most common acute complication is seizures. Please note seizures can be a feature of meningitis as well as complication of meningitis and it is a most common acute complication. The other complications include subdural effusion. Rarely you can get subdural empyma. Hydrocephalus can occur. Can predispose to brain abscess. Especially in children with immunodeficiency. And last, it can be associated with sensorineural hearing loss. And this is usually a complication noted with streptococcus pneumoniae followed by Haemophilus influenza. This is an MCQ question. Which bacteria is commonly associated with sensorineural hearing loss as a complication? It is streptococcus pneumoniae. If that is not given, then you can choose Haemophilus influenza type B. So these are the complications which can occur in meningitis. Now talking about the treatment of bacterial meningitis, it is obviously with IV antibiotics and the IV antibiotic of choice is third generation cephalosporin. which could either be a ceftriaxone or a cefotaxin. If there is no response by 48 to 72 hours after starting the antibiotic, you have to add vancomycin. This is the general protocol for empirical treatment of antibiotic in meningitis. Please remember the usual duration of antibiotic treatment is around 10 days. Some books say 10 to 14 days but general duration is 10 days. However, in neonates, it has to be given for a prolonged period of 3 weeks. Okay, so essential part of treatment is always always IV antibiotics for bacterial meningitis. In addition to antibiotics, steroids also play a very important role. The usual steroid which we give is dexamethasone which is given in the dose of 0.15 milligram per kilogram per dose every 6 hours for 2 days. And please remember it is usually started along with the first dose of antibiotic. What is the role of steroid? Because it's an anti-inflammatory agent, it decreases the inflammatory edema, thereby decreasing the intracranial tension or the intracranial pressure. Okay. The second important role of steroid is that it decreases the incidence of complications, especially sensorineural hearing loss. So these are the chief advantages as to why we give steroid in case of bacterial meningitis. Mm -hmm.